Hello, and welcome to our next presentation. This is day three, of the final day of the symposium. And on behalf of the MIT CDOIQ virtual symposium, we would like to thank all our sponsors who have sponsored the symposium this year. Please keep a lookout for a very special survey that we'll be sending out shortly. In the meantime, let me thank our sponsors, Deloitte, Informatica, Privacy Analytics, Dalwix, Fusion Alliance, KPMG, Santo Consultants, Tamer, Relation, Ali Data, Big ID, Bumi, Caserta, Citizen, Data Kitchen, Garage, Okira, Pilog, Click, ThoughtSpot, Eckerson, Global ID, Snowflake, and Starburst. Please take a chance to go to the Content Hub, see what content to have, download that, and if you get a chance, reach out to our partners. Without our partners, we would not be able to hold a symposium. Thank you, and we look forward to seeing you in 2021. Hi, everybody, and uh, welcome to the first session of the last day in breakout form. You're in session 15D, and yes, we're starting about 15 minutes late. There was a, a glitch in some of the technology here. Uh, I'm just going to be very brief and introduce uh, our two presenters. Uh, this is Cash Medi and Jeff Almstead, who are uh, listed as data governance domain experts. And most companies, when they say that, I would really question that issue, but I happen to have associated with uh, Informatica for many years. And it is true as a company, they deeply, deeply understand this. So we're looking forward to Cash and Jeff. Cash, I'll turn it over to you and let you introduce the part of the program, and we'll come back to the Q&As. Welcome everybody. Thanks so much for taking the time to attend our session today on data discovery, valuation, and data democratization. I'm Cash Medi. I work as a data governance and privacy domain expert here at Informatica. Joining me today, I have a dear colleague, Jeff Olmsted, who is our next generation analytics domain expert. Let's get started. We'll start by looking into the expanding role of CDOs. What we have seen is traditionally, the role of CDO was focused on the risk and compliance aspect. It has now shifted into empowering broad and consistent use of data to improve business outcomes. In fact, the IDC State of the CDO Survey, commissioned by Informatica, which was just released, found that four out of five of the top KPIs for CDOs are business-oriented outcomes, including business innovation and revenue generation, customer satisfaction and loyalty, operational efficiency and excellence, and lastly, productivity and capacity improvements. Next, what we see is the need for a data democratization environment. What we have seen here is CDOs are being asked by executive stakeholders and their teams, such as the chief executive officers, financial officers, marketing officers, and other teams to help them use data to improve efficiency and effectiveness of analytics and operational activities. Yet according to the IDC survey, half of the data collected is not being used to improve business performances. What CDOs reported as the challenge to broad and consistent use of data probably aren't surprising to you. We see a list of challenges, including discovering what data you have making sure business people understand the data that is available today. And lastly, making it easily available for use so analysts can, can use the data to create reports, scientists can find the data quickly to test algorithms or drive predictive models. Next, what we have is the, uh, the AI-powered intelligent platform. What we see here at Informatica is in order to support the data governance needs across a global community of 10,000 plus customers in various industries, Informatica delivers a purpose-built AI-powered intelligent platform. At the front end, we have the data governance layer, Axon. It allows users the ability to answer business questions covering what does the data mean? Where does it come from? Who owns it? The quality and privacy controls. Supporting the data governance module, automation comes from the data catalog, also known as the catalog of catalog. It allows organizations to procure technical metadata from a number of source systems, leveraging its auto scanning and tagging capabilities. 
Next is the data quality platform with over 5,000 plus Informatica customers using it to supply clean and trusted data across the enterprise. And lastly, we have data privacy, providing data privacy officers the ability to identify sensitive data and achieve audit readiness in growing regulations like GDPR, CCPA, and other types of regulations. And lastly, as part of the data governance platform, or as part of this intelligent platform, we have a concept called data marketplace. It's really about the collaboration between the data owners and data consumers. There are five highlights to data marketplace. One is data owners can create and publish trusted data to the marketplace. Two, users have the ability to shop for data while making sure there are appropriate quality and privacy controls. Third, there's literally a checkout button in the platform where users, when they like a data set, they can click the checkout button and formally request access to a data set. Four, tracking orders. Here, data owners and governance teams have the ability to track who is using what data for what purposes. And lastly, fulfillment. Once your approval request gets approved, two things could happen. Informatica can connect with your native provisioning systems like ticketing systems like ServiceNow or use its native provisioning capabilities, part of the data catalog to provide or deliver access to, to the appropriate data set. Let's see a demo of Data Marketplace to understand what online shopping experience around data looks like in a data democratization environment. Here we have three actors in the Data Marketplace demo. First is Joanna Atkins, a data steward responsible for publishing governed data to the marketplace. Second is David Johnson, a data consumer looking to create a report around customers. Lastly, Adam Smith, a data owner responsible for managing data access requests. Let's start with Joanna Atkins, who's looking to publish governed data to the data marketplace. Joanna arrives in Axon data governance platform to identify data sets for marketplace. Here she starts by reviewing a list of source systems in production, part of data warehousing. Joanna switches to the datasets tab to review datasets part of the warehouse. Please note, dataset is a collection of similar metadata. Joanna identifies a list of datasets to bulk publish. Here, Joanna can choose a data category to associate selected datasets. Please note, here you can see a data category list organized by business lines. Users have the flexibility to organize data by data domains, projects, or other types of their own. Joanna selects customer operations and hits save and close to finish publishing governed data to the marketplace. This brings us to the next persona in our story. Here we have David Johnson, a data consumer or a business analyst looking to shop for data for report requirements. David arrives in Axon Data Marketplace to shop for data for his reporting needs. David can see a list of data categories available to choose from. David decides to select the operations category. Please note here you can see data categories by business lines. Users have the flexibility to organize data or compartmentalize data by data domains, projects, or other concepts. Next, David can self-service for data in the marketplace. He is filtering by system to search for data in the local warehouse. Filtering by glossary to include poster code or data that contains poster code. And by system owner, Colin Craig and applies the search. This brings David the desired results that is personal data. David selects the personal data to review trust. Here David can view the purpose of personal data, personal data's ownership, and data sets that makes up personal data category. Here he can see a list of attributes to request access. As part of the assessment, David is reviewing the quality score marked as 85%. He can see the breakdown by each dimension.
David also notices the quality for the national ID attribute is not so good and failing at 76%. He can click the score to see where the data quality is failing. Next, David is looking for the delivery options. Which shows personal data can be available in S3 environment or Informatica's native data provisioning utility in the Enterprise Data Catalog, EDC. David can also review the policy controls established on personal data category. Here it shows default policy and terms of use. After a thorough analysis, David decides to check out the personal data category. This prompts David to fill out a business justification form and to add any additional comments for the data owner to review. David adds he needs the personal data sets for risk analysis report. and adds additional comments to inquire if the data is available in other SQL formats. He can now click Next to accept the usage guideline and submit order. This successfully creates a data sharing agreement between the data owner and the data consumer. David can click on the My Orders page to see his order for personal data is pending. David can click on the My Orders page to see his order for personal data is pending approval from the data owner. He can click into the order agreement to review more details. Here, David can add additional comments or cancel order if needed. This brings us to our last persona, Adam Smith, responsible for reviewing David Johnson's request for personal data. Adam can approve or reject David's request based on his assessment. Adam arrives in the data marketplace where he can see the data I own tab. Access history around his data. He clicks on the task tab to review list of requests from data consumers. Here, Adam is interested in David's request for personal data. Adam can click reject or approve David's request. In the approval process, Adam is adding comments and external ticket for ServiceNow and clicks approve. Here, Adam can review additional details on personal data. The Access tab shows list of pending approval requests. The Request Fulfillment tab shows pending fulfillment jobs. Lastly, Access History showing list of data consumers who have access to personal data. Here, Adam can easily revoke access to any here, Adam can easily revoke access to any existing approved orders. Now, David Johnson is checking for the order status. David arrives in the data marketplace to see my orders page. Here, David can see the order was fulfilled. David can click into the personal data order to see the timeline, which shows the conversation between David and Adam during the approval process. Here, David can see access details to see additional information. In summary, you have seen three actors in the data marketplace overview. Joanna Atkins, a data steward, published governed data to the marketplace. Next was David Johnson, a data consumer or a business analyst, was looking to create a report around personal data. And lastly, Adam Smith, a data owner who approved David's request. Thanks, Cash. My name is Jeff Olmsted. I'm a domain expert in Informatica in our data governance practice. And while data catalogs and business glossaries have been around for many years, democratizing the data within these key enterprise solutions has become even more important to chief data officers. What I'm gonna show you over the next 10 or 15 minutes is how you can analyze and maximize the value of the data assets within your organization and really drive business value across your entire organization, further enhancing your ability to discover and trust these critical data assets. Informatica's data asset analytics, which is a component of the enterprise data catalog, 
provides some key benefits in democratizing your data. First, it allows you to gain insight into your organizations, the data usage, and the overall user adoption of that data. Secondly, it helps in identifying and socializing best practices to empower data-driven decision-making. And finally, it provides for understanding and maximizing data asset value. Within there, a lot of times within a data catalog, the questions that a lot of users ask are, who's using the data? What assets are they using? How are they using it? What's the rate? Now, who's doing data governance? How are the top contributors within my organization accessing these, this data? The data asset analytics components, the, 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 the reports that I'm gonna show you, allow you to answer all of those questions. So when we look at user adoption, so the user adoption shows the ability of who has been provisioned within the catalog and how many active users are using it. And then in terms of the, the adoption rate and the searches, so it, gives, it provides you that information in terms of who's using it, what assets they're doing, what features they're using it, and for when. I have the ability within this to change my time frame, so I can go back and say, show me what it looked like a month ago, so I can see all the users that came in within the last month, and then I can contrast that against over the last three months to say, am I getting, is my adoption getting greater, or is it getting less? Again, allowing me to say how and where do I want to then push that information going forward. The data asset inventory allows us to really understand all the assets that are contained within the catalog. So here I can see that I've got 67 resources across 17 different types of assets. So again, when, when you ask the question is, where are my data assets living? Where are the most value that I'm getting out of this? This is where you're going to be able to go to to say where all this information comes from. And I can look at the resource growth to say, how am I actually implementing the data catalog for use for my business community? Is this growing or is it not? I can see that my asset growth is growing here and I can even drop it down to different areas and say based upon the different resources, based upon the other resources that have a higher data value, or maybe you provide additional information about that, I can then understand and to go through and say, is my growth in these specific areas increasing or not? Within data asset enrichment, this is where you really have the ability to have your business terms associated with data assets because this allows you to increase your overall data literacy and usage. So when you associate business terms to the physical technical assets under the covers, that allows your consumers, that allows you as a business user to be able to search for data, how you call it within your business. So identifying those areas where you're not, where you don't have business terms associated with technical areas provides you the ability to say, where can I spend my time to better understand the objects and who's using that and how, they're, how it's being done. Data domains is another key concept within our enterprise data catalog. This is the ability for us to automatically go through and find specific data within your ecosystem. So identifying these data domains and the assets that are associated with that, such as social security numbers, phone numbers, city, state, city, zip, et cetera, and you can actually build your own data domains. And when you do that, that helps you identify potential privacy risks that are contained within your underlying ecosystems. So I can quickly see here that over the last three months, we've identified 121 different data domains within our data sets, but those have only been associated with less than 1% of the data assets. So I want to be able to take advantage of what the enterprise data catalog brings to the table in terms of automatically searching through your assets, automatically tagging those data domains to the assets, and then allowing us to then, as a business consumer, understand where those potential areas are. And then finally, the ability to provide automatic lineage and impact analysis within the catalog is another huge piece that we provide. And this lineage and impact analysis allows you within your organization to identify the specific systems and processes that are using these data assets so you can better prioritize the cleansing and governing activities.
So I can quickly identify and understand where those assets, the lineage and impact analysis is, is being deployed and where it's not. So again, I know where to spend my time. So in this case here, I can see that I've got roughly about 30% of my assets have lineage and impact. I like to see that in the 70 to 80% range because that's telling me that I've got data that is completely connected throughout my ecosystem and I can provide a self-service mechanism for any end user to come in and be able to find information about where the information where the data is flowing to and where it's coming from so when you start understanding or asking the questions as to who's using the data how they're using it what business terms are associated with that this gives me a very quick understanding as to how that's being used within the underlying organization Within specifically the user collaboration, when you start asking questions such as who are the top contributors? You know, who are my subject matter experts? How are they inferring collaboration across the groups? You know, which groups and data sets need more attention and why? I can quickly understand through this to better look at this to say, how am I identifying these data experts? You know, who's asking the questions? How are they being answered? What reviews are being done for this? Within this, this graph here, my degree of collaboration across my resources, I can quickly see that I've got roughly 70% of the data contained within my catalog has zero collaboration against this. So I want to be able to, because the goal of an enterprise catalog is to allow an environment that allows your users to collaborate with their peers and to better understand and to ask real time questions about that. This is going to allow us to tell us where am I going to spend my time? How do I want my subject matter experts to go in and the domain users to fully go through and make this data, these assets more usable for this? So the questions and answers allow you as an organization to increase your overall data literacy to be able to identify the types of data sets that are most often used and to identify the challenges to a broader use of your data within your organization. When you understand what those most common data assets are, that's when you can spend the most time doing that. Flip that 80-20 rule to say how, rather than spending 80% of your time trying to find the assets that are most used within your organization, we want you to spend that 80 or 90% of your time actually turning that data into information and providing value going forward. And that value is then represented within the data value screen. And this is where you can really drive home and fully understand, you know, how do you assign values to these data assets, whether it be at a resource level, to say at a specific resource, whether it be DB2 or Oracle, or maybe you've got Snowflake data, you can come out and say, well, is one data resource more valuable than the other? And as you do that, your information is gonna change through that. And you'll see the data value based upon grow or, or shrink based on how, how that is. The asset enrichment. We talked earlier about the data, the data domains. If you don't have a data domain associated with that, having to go through and find where all the potential sensitive information is or find where you've built your own data domains to automatically discover where that is, you can say, I want to then provide a higher value for that because that's gonna then tell me where those high higher valued assets are within the underlying ecosystem. And when you have all of this, you have now the ability to provide and put an actual value on the data that's contained within your organization. You've democratized your data at that point in time. So what we've done is we've looked at how we can take the physical assets, the physical meta information that we're ingesting into the data catalog and provide business level insights on top of all that information. And all of this can also be downloaded and then exported into a third party solution such as a Power BI, a Tableau, where you can then build all of that into a more shareable type of a format that you can then present to upper management. So what we wanted to talk about in terms of the key benefits for this data asset analytics is that it's providing you insight into the data assets that is demanded by each group of user. Visibility into who's using the data. What are the top contributors and influencers? Who are my subject matter experts that I want to go through and I, you know, who's collaborating with the data? 
I'm going to be able to spot trends and uncover usage patterns that allow me to see relevant data assets across the enterprise that are out there. Identifying data usage is a huge plus to this. Understanding what data is being used most, the, data, the lineage and impact analysis is going to tell me, are we using the right data to flow downhill to those, those resources that are asking themselves the questions that are making data-driven decisions? And then finally, understanding that the value of any data asset within the catalog, we want to focus our organization on the most valued assets. And the data value component will allow you to be able to figure out where those most valued assets are and then drive greater value with specific data knowledge, collaboration, and usage across your organization. Thank you for spending your time with me today, and I look forward to answering any questions that you may have during our question and answer session. Thank you, Cash. And Jeff, we have a bunch of questions, and as I mentioned before, we're a little bit limited in our time, so we're going to jump right in. And thank you guys for being so engaged in here. First question is, how is the data quality measured? Yeah, I could, I could take that one and also invite Jeff uh, to come in and uh, chime in on this. Um, for data quality, so Informatica has a data quality solution. So a lot of times what we see is customers use Informatica's data quality and publish results to one of our governance module where business users or any consumer across the organization can see what the data means what the quality looks like. And even there are workflows, anytime you see quality is not on par with the threshold, you could run workflows to remediate data quality challenges. And anything to add here, Jeff? No, so a, a great, great point there, Cash. And, and really the data quality is measured by how you define that within your organizations. So in terms of data completeness, data consistency, then as you build those out, those data quality measures are shared across not only the marketplace as Cash showed you, but also within the enterprise catalog itself. So it's truly an enterprise solution at that point in time. Super. I think this is a related question then. Can this process be effective without a data dictionary or will a data dictionary be necessary prior? Yeah, so it, uh, I could take that again. Uh, one of the things we've seen with customers is they, they start out with a quality framework in mind. So uh, you could start out with a data dictionary where you know what data you want to uh, clean. Or sometimes what we see is customers first want to get, um, <clears throat> get alignment. I can't speak today. Get alignment on quality. So they start defining uh, rules and standards around data quality run it through workflows so they can get vote across the stakeholder community. And once that's approved, now they can identify, okay, what data do we want to consider to apply those rules? So short answer is you don't have to have a data dictionary, but it's nice to have uh, in, in those scenarios. Very good. Uh, next question uh, from one of our main stalwarts, Dave Eddy, uh, who attends all of these things and probably has more years of experience between uh, under his belt than all the rest of us combined. But uh, Dave, welcome. And his question is, is Informatica cataloging the data or the systems that make the data? Great question. I'll, I'll take this one. Um, so we're actually ingesting the meta information from the systems themselves. However, we do, within Informatica, profile those systems and provide additional information on top of that. So I always like to, to, to say we read the book. We don't just tell you where the book is in the library. So we'll tell you what's contained within those underlying assets by, by, do, by using our data quality profiling engine to do that. We don't store that data into our catalog. We store the results of that data in the catalog so that your end users have a better understanding as to specifically what the assets are that they're searching for, they're doing the discovery on, and then potentially within the marketplace, when they're requesting that data, they have better understanding what that data is. Super. Uh, of course, we're all going to have to change our language on this because, you know, the, the, the young people growing up won't know what either a book or a library is. So, uh, well, we'll keep working on that. Either that or I'll die off and nobody, somebody, it'll be somebody else's problem. Uh, next question. Where is all this data stored? Good question. I'll, I'll, uh, I'll answer the kind of on the, on the cataloging side of the cash if you want to maybe answer it on the marketplace side of the house. On, on the cataloging side, this is all stored within um, a Hadoop ecosystem today. And again, it's just the meta information. It's not the data itself. Um, and then on the Axon or marketplace side, cash, cash can handle that one. 
Yeah, I can elaborate on that. Uh, one thing we have seen is there's a underlying graph database. Uh, we use Postgres, right? And, and also a lot of these technologies that you see can are certified to go on cloud or on-prem. So we are really giving customers the flexibility to choose uh, where they want to uh, install these uh, modules, uh, if you will. Okay. What are the best practices in encouraging business units to join this catalog slash ecosystem, such as during pilot stage? I think these guys are looking for something very practical here. Yeah, I, I could take that and Jeff, uh, feel free to elaborate. Uh, my one statement on that is don't boil the ocean, right? So what we often see is a lot of customers are tempted to connect to every system that they own. Uh, but the success that would, what we have seen in, in most projects is starting small, uh, identifying what systems and applications really impact your business. And then once you have a, a blueprint, you can scale that model. Uh, Jeff, what have you seen with some of our other customers? Yeah, I, I was actually talking to um, a customer yesterday about the same question they asked that, and they asked him, you know, hey, do I start with the catalog? Do I start with Axon? What do I do first? And we were, t we were we were discussing the fact that really it's 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 not a binary option, right? It's not one or the other. A lot of times it's both, right? It's you have the technical piece, you've got the business piece, and you've got both trains going in parallel. And then you really see the benefit when they then combine together and they integrate because they're sharing the underlying pieces within our AI and ML algorithms. So being able to do to do one one or the other is good, but if you're able to start both at the same time or similar times and then integrate them together, that's when you really see the benefits of a true governance solution. Great, great. All right, next question. Uh, does Informatica view the data governance landscape be, sorry, I said that wrong, let me start over again. How does Informatica view the data governance landscape being a technology provider? Yeah, it's very simple. So it's, it, what's interesting is anytime we walk into a meeting, depending on who we talk to, their definition of data governance is different. As a technology vendor, what we see is data governance is really the collaboration between the business and technology. And we understand there are variations when it comes to business and technology. So when we ask business folks, hey, how do you define data governance? Their answer usually is, hey, we're looking to attain commonality around data so people can easily understand the data we have. And business is typically motivated to do data governance for compliance, for insights analytics, to drive uh, data-driven culture. And lastly, you know, post-COVID even, what we see is uh, a lot of companies going through digital transformation journeys, right? So we see that as one definition from the business side. Now on the technology side, we see it's a, it's a slightly different definition because technology is very much focused around consolidating data that's spread across multiple systems and applications. So they start out with, hey, for me, data governance is really about starting with a data catalog and then getting appropriate uh, context from the business community. So as a short answer here is, we really see as the collaboration between the business and technology groups. Jeff, anything to add on that? No, it's a great answer. Super. Thanks, Jeff. Uh, very simple question. How is data security insured? Do you want to take that, Jeff? Yeah. Yeah, I was say, that, that's a great question, especially in this day and age where, you know, security, privacy is, is, is always a huge concern. Um, so as I mentioned earlier, within specifically within the data dictionary, we're not storing the actual physical data itself within the system. We're only storing the results. So when you go through and you profile maybe a million records or a couple million records, you're only storing the results of that information into that. And there's nothing PAI or, or sensitive about that of what we're storing within there. So there's, there's no reason or way for us to, to in, ingest that information uh, on, the, on top of that. And then in terms of the marketplace uh, cash, as you kind of showed how they request that data, maybe you can talk about how the security is provided around that. Yeah, so we provide really role-based security. So, you know, like Jeff mentioned, we're not dealing with the actual data, but just the metadata, which is the data about data. And I think the only PII data I would say is just information about users that you would add in the platform, which is also coming in from your LDAP or single sign-on, right? So as part of the platform, uh, you know, we provide role-based security. So you have the ability to control who can create, read, update, delete, any of the things. Uh, so you could set, a power user versus a read-only user and control what they could see even in the platform. 
so I, and a lot of these modules are uh, created with privacy uh, in mind. So there's well, you know, huge privacy uh, component across all the modules that you've seen today. Super. Two questions I'm going to combine into one. It's uh, questions about data democratization. Uh, you mentioned it in there. Uh, there are a couple of things. What does it mean for an organization? And do you have any customers that are leveraging that? So I guess they're looking for some success stories. Yeah, no, that's, that's great. So the way we view data democratization is really providing free access to data. So, you know, a lot of times what we see is customers already have data across different functions, different departments. But the challenge is companies have a hard time finding relevance around data, right? Or cross-sharing information. So to, to us, data democratization is really providing free access to data while ensuring quality and privacy controls. In terms of a customer example, I can think of a public example that we have of uh, one of our automobile customer, Nissan. So they use Informatica's technology to drive a data democratization environment for the analytics community. So if you ever own a Nissan car, anytime you walk into their service center, the agent would look up your car information using your VIN number on the iPad and the iPad will tell them, oh, this car needs so-and-so services, you know, or so-and-so products. So behind that, Nissan has a democratized environment where they use Informatica's data catalog to consolidate all the data that they have. So you know, analysts can create forecasting reports, uh, scientists can run uh, predictive models, which can eventually have a monetary impact like a customer walking into the store and, and getting uh, prescriptive suggestions like, hey, what do you need? What a personalized example that would be. Uh, so that's how we are, uh, you know, really impacting the world around us. And Nissan is just one customer. There are other customers. Uh, we have a global community of 10,000 plus customers uh, who have um, uh, been using our technology for a while and we could share additional uh, information there. Is, is that a fair answer? Anything to add here, Jeff, uh, in terms of data democratization, any examples that you've seen? No, that's, that's good. I know there's a, I know we were kind of short on time, so. Yeah. Great. Uh, another couple questions I'm going to combine here. Um, they're asking about the use of AI and ML against the, uh, okay, so the first question is, do you run AI ML against the systems rather than the data? And then there's another question, can you clarify how AI is being used in your product? I'm sure there's a lot of ways, but a couple of examples would be really good. Yeah, I, I could take that. Uh, Jeff, why don't you take that? I'll elaborate your answer. Sure. Yeah, so that, that's a great question, right? I mean, because you know those are buzzwords now that everybody everybody's using. But that's you know we we take that in terms of the first question. We run it against the systems versus the data. We primarily use our AI and ML on the data, right? To to kind of flip that 80-20 rule so that you're not spending a majority of your time trying to discover where the data is within your systems. So as I said, we use it for data similarity, data discovery. As we start understanding in terms of you know where uh, PII, SPI, PHI is within your organization. That's where we use a lot of the AI and ML algorithms to better understand, to automatically discover and find those types of data assets that, you know, the needle in the haystack type of a thing. So that's kind of where specifically within the data catalog, when, when you ask the first question about, you know, the data, how do we store that? When we're profiling that data, we're using the AI and ML algorithms to understand where that is, to see how it's similar to other data sets within the organization, to group those together so that we can find out and you can understand where do you have potential areas of risk, where do you have potential areas to democratize your data, and then finally, how do you then take that to then present that information downstream to something like a marketplace to allow access to those data sets to other to your users. Yeah, that's a great. Just, just to add to his point, what, what I've seen, I'll use a customer example. So it uh, reminds me of a insurance customer who's using our technology at the enterprise level. One of the challenges they described in the analytics community is like people when they are creating analytics reports, uh, an analyst would go into a system and they can't tell if a column is showing a claims number versus an account number. The challenge they had is because they did not follow any metadata standards. So the power of our AI is, uh, so we look at your actual data patterns and the metadata patterns. So, and then we could auto scan and tag the data. We could say, hey, this, this data here looks like street address. This data here looks like sensitive social security number, right? So we can actually introspect 
your actual system and then bring in the results to, to publish uh, for a broader consumption. So I, I would add that there. Okay, thank you. Um, I think that the next series here really has to do with not understanding, I guess, the philosophy of Informatica. Maybe people just aren't as familiar with your company uh, as it. So many people are looking at you guys as, as strictly a, a um, uh, they, they've seen the elephant from different angles, I guess, is maybe the best way to, to do this. So maybe you guys could talk for a minute about sort of the philosophical approach, because Informatica has been focused on this business here for 15, actually 20 years that I know of that I've been working 47. with you guys. 47. 47, there you go. Thank you. Um, so I think that would probably help place some of these questions in context for everybody. I don't know who wants to take that. Yeah, I could, I could take that and also allow Jeff, because he has been with Informatica for a long time, so he can also add that. Um, well, traditionally, I think why Informatica has been so successful in the data management space, um, we invest $200 million in our research and development, which is more than any of the annual uh, revenue for some of the startups out there. So that's one amount of monetary investment that goes into understanding our customer needs and bringing that over to the product. There are, I would say, essentially four things in the philosophy. One is the embedding uh, automation. Right, so we're bringing automation and to eliminate any of the labor intensive exercises, especially when it comes to data governance, we see, you know, people stitching together business definitions with technical metadata. So we, we saw that and we thought, okay, how do we automate this problem? So anytime a business is entering a definition, we can go identify corresponding technical metadata by connecting to a broad array of systems and applications, right? So that's one piece. The other I would say is the scalability. So we have some of the largest um, you know, organizations who use Informatica today uh, to really like the example of Nissan who is using us to democratize data and have a monetary impact. So that's just one. Uh, in terms of the scalability, we have close to uh, uh, you know, customers managing up to 100 million plus data assets in the environment. That's one. And then the other piece is extensibility of the platform. So we always think about extensibility. We have multiple products. And even if you look at Gartner, we're leading in five different uh, categories there. And we've been doing that for many years, right? So in terms of extensibility, like just the approach around data governance, data catalog, we just don't stop there. We invest in the full suite of solutions like Informatica also provides a data quality solution. And we have about 5,000 plus customers. So what we provide to our customers is, hey, you don't have to go pick, you know, governance for from one vendor versus, uh, you know, data quality from another vendor and break your head integrating those solutions. We are actually giving the whole suite as an out of the box uh, component. That's one. And lastly is the agility, right? So here, what I have seen is how do we enable customers to go from pilot phase to production phase in, in limited amount of time? So we've seen customers going to production in amount of uh, three months to a six months to a year time frame, depending on their scope. So I would say automation, scalability, extensibility, and the agility. Uh, anything to add there, uh, Jeff? Now, I would just say, I, as Cash said, I've actually been with Informatica for 12 years. Um, I took a two-year hiatus to go work for a startup on the data prep space. But one of the things that we're focusing on now really heavily is cloud first, cloud native. So a lot of the solutions that you're seeing that were back in the old you know, data integration to metadata management, data quality, now to data governance, everything you saw today is cloud ready. And it will soon be cloud first in terms of being able to truly provide that next generation solution as we, as you and your organizations are looking to take advantage of all of those monetary and capabilities that come with those types of ecosystems, we're taking the, the best in breed solutions that we've been offering for the last 25 years and we're pro providing it on a very modular and modern platform. Great, thanks, thanks for adding that. And uh, I'm gonna go back to what Cash said too just my knowledge of the company is that they have been thinking long-term in all of this. So rather than getting in and looking at it as strictly a tools play, there's been a good deal of strategic effort on trying to forecast what are the needs people are gonna have in the future. Um, let me, I don't have a question on this one here, but I'll, I can take my moderator points and, and do it. Um, we've seen a lot of push at this event and others that say that um, 
people and process problems are by far much more difficult to deal with than technology problems. And a lot of people try to say, well, that's just data governance, but I think Informatica has actually made some things uh, to address that as well. I can remember one instance when I was working for a company in Europe and they had a, a system that they sort of had to watch back days before parallelism until it finished and then somebody else would, would do something else. And they actually requested Informatica to say, this is a, a waste of human capital. Can you guys figure out a way to make this so it doesn't have to be attended? And you guys absolutely responded to that particular piece and that resulted in a sale. I don't know that it was critical on your on your path there, but it was certainly responsiveness. So again, long, long story short, what about the people in process issues? How can what you guys as a company do help people to deal with those people in process issues as well as the technical issues? Yeah, great, great question there, uh, Peter. And also invite Jeff here to add in. One of the benefits that we have is Informatica has traditionally sold a lot of technical pro uh, products, right? Supporting the technology, um, uh, the business unit. Uh, what we have now also seen is for the last uh, five years, we have also provided solutions to the business community. So a lot of times I think when it comes to people and uh, process, uh, biggest challenge is dealing with cultural changes between IT and business. And we being in a position where we understand challenges on each side, it makes it really simple for us to think about how does, you know, someone implementing a process on the business side would impact other pockets of the organization, right? So we have that view that really helped us be more prescriptive with customers and even add that. One example I would give is a lot, a lot of times, like on the IT side, you have data architects or data modelers who are out there, you know, making sure product services have accurate reflection in the systems and applications where they design all the models and stuff. On a, and, and a lot of times the conversation is the architects or the modelers are talking to the business to get additional context. And that activity is super labor intensive. So we recognize that. What we have done is, okay, if, if someone were to start on the business side and say, hey, I care about this KPI, and then tell the IT counterpart, like, hey, where else this information exists in my ecosystem? You know, it would take several weeks for them to figure out go, out, go through all the models, go through all the queries that they have, and then tie that back to that definition. So one thing we have understood is providing automation in that area would eliminate and increase, increase productivity for the, for the end user. So we implemented AI and machine learning algorithms that can really go out there, identify data, then also provide input to the business through maybe a, a user-friendly application where they can review and approve and curate. So both working it in parallel with machine learning as well as human curation. What would you add there, uh, Jeff? Anything to add? No, I think, I think you covered it very well. I mean, really uh, what we've tried to do over the last probably three to four or five years as we've kind of really built out our, our axon and our governance solutions is to bridge that gap between or bridge the, 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 the area between the technical components and the business components. Because really, as you said, Peter, it's the process is usually always what gets in the way. And we want to remove those boundaries to allow for a better governance solution. I'm going to add one more piece to the things that both of you mentioned, and that is you also create a common vocabulary, and that helps people communicate, which also helps with those uh, pieces. Well, um, the last question we have in here is what is the entry level price point? I'm sure that's not an easy question to answer, um, but I'll certainly give you a crack at it. I'm sure if this dollar, you'd have a billion customers, right? Well, uh, I should say, I, I should follow up on the pricing point. Um, we're not in a position to share that. Of course not. Um, but you are in a position to talk to people and you have a booth. Correct. We do. Yeah, if you, right. you can always always stop by the booth, you know, let us know. We can we can reach out to we can reach out to you on it with, with our sales the account teams and whatnot. Um, I will tell you that it's not, you know, we're not talking a large amount. Um, we we our, our our solution is focused for the common, you know, it's 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 built for everybody. Um, one of the things that I always talk about when I talk about our, our combined solution is that we feel that data governance, the democratization of this data is for everyone. So we do not do licensing models that requires kind of a, a, a user, you know, how many people are actually going to be doing the discovery, viewing the data, et cetera, because our, 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 at our core, we feel that everybody should have access to all the assets that are contained within their organizations. So that's yep. kind of where we go, where, where, you know, where, where you can kind of take that as well. Yeah. And, and one thing I would add there, Peter, not to totally deflect that question is 
you know, the common feedback we get from customers is they get a lot of functionality uh, and pay less, right? So like, for example, we don't charge for read, read only users. It's absolutely free across the whole enterprise. But really, there, there are models, you know, the packages that we can really help accommodate for an enterprise level. So we have customers with, you know, large ELAs, as well as we have customers who are, you know, a small size organization and they need limited number of seats or limited number of uh, connectors, if you will. Uh, so we have uh, different models to accommodate uh, those needs. So I, I would add that. Absolutely. Sure. Well, Jeff and Cash, thank you guys for a very good presentation. And uh, we had some terrific interaction. I think most of our delegates are running to the next session that's getting ready to get started. So I want to thank both of you for taking your time and sharing these insights with us here and encourage everybody to go visit all of our vendors. But uh, in this case, uh, any follow-up questions, you can directly get to Jeff and Cash in the, uh, the breakout rooms. So uh, thank you, everybody. And our next session starts in just a few minutes. Thank you. Thanks for having us.